Everybody get a seat and get ready for some engineering and hardware and cool stuff. So welcome to our last day of this great conference. And we're shifting gears a little bit. And we're going to talk a little bit about some Bluetooth stuff this morning. So many of you might have watched the WWDC sessions or been present at the WWDC sessions when we talked about iBeacons. And we're going to show you a little bit about what some of that stuff is, talk a little bit about some products, show you a little bit of stuff about watches, and what's in your conference app right now. So first up is Alexi, who's going to talk about Twi and some more cool Bluetooth stuff. Good morning. I want to start off by thanking both uh, Tim Burks and yourselves for giving me the chance to speak here at Renaissance. So thank you. My name is Alexei Novikov. I am an independent iOS app developer. And I develop apps under my own brand of Yodel Code. And the goal of my talk uh, today is to familiarize you with Twi, which is the uh, built-in feature in, uh, it's a built-in feature in the Renaissance Conference app. Twi uses Bluetooth LE, and I'm hoping that the open source code that we're providing to Twi will help you get started in developing your own Bluetooth LE enabled apps. So first of all, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Bluetooth LE LE standing for low energy, is a low power, low cost, wireless communication technology that is in every iPhone and iPad that has shipped in the last three years. Now for many years, we've been hearing about the internet of things, where every little thing is going to get connected or is getting connected to the internet. And even though Bluetooth LE is a big enabler of that, Bluetooth LE is really more about connecting us as people and our devices to everything else in our immediate physical environment. So just have a look at all the different Bluetooth LE devices, activity trackers, watches, heart rate straps. And these are just the devices I own. There's a lot of, a lot of other stuff out there. And uh, let's take a quick look at what are some of the other devices. Oh, I should also mention that to date, it's already been estimated that over 1 billion uh, Bluetooth LE devices have shipped. And, and I really believe that Bluetooth LE is going to be the next big thing. And in fact, I really think it is the next big thing. So this is the quick set uh, door lock. This is a door that you can unlock with your iPhone. And with all of the uh, support that Apple's built into uh, core Bluetooth, which is the frameworks for uh, Bluetooth LE in an iPhone, they've got it set up so that this will actually work in the background. So when you come home and you want to unlock your front door, you don't even have to pull out your iPhone. It will just unlock as soon as you get in front of your door. And think about how easy it is now to provide virtual keys to guests so they can uh, come and go from your house while they're staying with you. This is the Calibre Bluetooth LE toothbrush. Now, I never saw this one coming. <laughs> but when you think about it, it's just, I think it's just really cool. Now we're going to have a device that's going to be able to tell us how often we brush, how long we brush, how well we brush, it's going to shatter any kind of delusions we have about our own dental hygiene. <laughs> this is a product called Tile, a product that I could have used a month ago when I lost my wallet, never to be found. And it is basically a very tiny little tag that you're able to attach to any kind of physical object. And if this object, we'll use my wallet as an example, wanders beyond the radius of what Bluetooth 
LE can detect, which is typically about 80 to 100 feet, um, it will warn you that that device is no longer nearby. And, and if perchance that you lose your device and you don't even get that notice, like you left your wallet uh, at a cafe or at a department store, and you only notice it missing when you get home, if somebody else's app that's running, or somebody else's iPhone that's running the uh, Tile app finds your wallet or finds my wallet, it will report that up to the, to the cloud and you'll get a notification. So even though you might lose something that's not nearby, somebody else may find it for you. I think this is just going to be an incredible product. This is called the Copenhagen Wheel. It is a self-contained um, retrofit for a bicycle to turn it into an electric bike. It contains, um, it's a self-contained module that includes a hub motor, electronics, and a battery. And it's supposed to retrofit on any kind of bike. And the thing is, is that it doesn't offer much of an interface. Well, if you have an iPhone with Bluetooth LE, which you already have, um, you'll be able to get information like how fast you're going, how much of a battery charge you've got left and how far you can go before you need to recharge. Not only that, you'll be able to use your iPhone to lock your Copenhagen wheel so that nobody else can ride off with your fancy new electric bike. And that brings me to, uh, to Twee, which is just another way that you can use Bluetooth LE. And in this particular case, we're using Bluetooth LE communicating from device to device. On the left-hand side, you have a list of people that are near you listed by proximity. On the right-hand side, you have a historical account of all those people that you've ever encountered while you've been here at the conference with a cumulative score that indicates how close they've been to you and how frequently they've been around you. Now, I want to say that TWI is really an experiment. And it's an experiment to see what happens when you have a lot of Bluetooth LE devices uh, in a single room. And, and I think it's been a little bit harsh on the iPhone. I, I saw a post on Glassboard that said, um, you know, I think this is like, you know, melting my Fitbit. I can't get my Fitbit data. And, uh, and so, um, you may have actually experienced a problem with TWI. I know I've seen it where what you're actually seeing is a bunch of gray circles. And uh, I haven't dug deep into this, but I think it's just really stressing out the uh, Bluetooth radio because we've got so many people running the same Bluetooth LE service. But if you want to get unstuck here, all you have to do is bring up the control panel, turn off Bluetooth um, for the iPhone at the top there, turn it back on, and you should be able to get back to a place where you're actively getting a list of all the uh, people that are nearby you. So we're going to um, just um, look at what's happening uh, under the hood here. And, and I'm going to start off with a few basic concepts about core Bluetooth, which is Apple's representation or, or their, it's the way that you interact with Bluetooth LE on an iPhone. You use the core Bluetooth frameworks. And so um, a couple of concepts, or a few concepts here. The first one is advertising. With a bunch of Bluetooth uh, LE devices, um, and one device that wants to find information, and, and another device that wants to provide information, one of those devices has to advertise that it's around. So there's a concept of advertising. Um, it's just a wireless uh, signal that gets sent out, uh, a little bit of data information that says, yoo-hoo, I'm over here. Then there's the notion of device discovery. So it's basically discovering these devices that are out there advertising. 
Then there's service discovery, which is once you find a device, trying to find out what kind of device is it? What kind of service does it provide? Is it a, is it a heart rate strap? Is it uh, an electric bike wheel? Is it a, a watch? What is it? And then connecting to it to, to get more information about the actual data that it offers for the particular services. So when it comes to core Bluetooth concepts or just Bluetooth LE concepts in general, this is the one slide you should get. So if you ignore everything else today, just pay attention to this one slide. Bluetooth LE has this notion of what's called a central and a peripheral. And these are really just two fancy words for something that has data and something that wants data. So peripheral has data, a central wants data. So in the example of the Copenhagen wheel, it's got data about your velocity and how much power you've got left, perhaps <coughs> the last time you recharged your, your Copenhagen wheel. And your iPhone wants that data. It wants to display it on the screen. And it's not exclusively a one-way uh, data interaction because you can actually use your iPhone to lock the Copenhagen wheel. So there is some capability to do bidirectional data exchange. But in general, think of the central as something, as something that wants data and the peripheral has data. Now, one of the cool things is that the iPhones that we have can be both a peripheral and a central. And they can be a peripheral and a central at the same time. And, and that's very cool for a couple of things. One is it allows you to use an iPhone to simulate a new piece of hardware that you might be building so that you can build your Bluetooth LE app for it before any actual hardware is available. And then the other thing you can do with it is create sort of creative apps where they're interacting between two iPhones. Um, and one of them is Twi. Um, if you get a chance to check out um, uh, a new game that's come out on, um, um, on the iPhone, it's called Pickpocket. It's spelled P-K-P-K-T. And it's a game where uh, everybody's running this Bluetooth LE enabled app pickpocket and you try to pick somebody else's pocket before they pick your pocket. Very creative. By the way, <clears throat> I think every time somebody uh, tweets about this talk, I'm getting a little Bluetooth LE uh, message on my Pebble watch. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to talk about something very abstract here for just one slide, so please hang uh, hang with me. In core Bluetooth, there's an object called a, uh, a CB peripheral manager. And this CB peripheral manager is what you use to set up the data and the data structures that you want to advertise to another central device. On the central side, you have the CB central manager. And what the CB central manager does is it scanning all the time to see what other peripheral devices are out there. And so this is really the, the thing that starts off any kind of communication between two Bluetooth LE devices. So when you start looking at the uh, core Bluetooth uh, implementation or APIs in more detail, um, these are the, this is the place where you will start. Now, I could go into a lot more detail with core Bluetooth. I'm not going to do that, uh, but I am going to uh, recommend that you go and watch these three videos from WWDC. Two years ago, um, there were the two videos, Core Bluetooth 101 and Advanced Core Bluetooth, and Core Bluetooth from last year. And uh, these three videos takes you about three hours to watch them all, and uh, you'll be surprised at how much um, information is in these videos, it's well presented, and you'll have everything you need to start writing your own core Bluetooth LE uh, enabled apps. Okay, so um, 
Please don't be intimidated by the gargantuan iPhone. Um, <coughs> it's just as friendly as a small one. Um, yeah. <laughs> Oops, it's leaked. So um, the circles that you see on this slide um, represent objects in the TWI source code. So when you start looking at the source, you'll see um, classes for attendee view, attendee, attendee browser, and so on. The other thing you'll notice about this slide is that um, we have a blue circle. It's called the attendee <coughs> browser. That is the same color as you saw previous to a central. So this iPhone is acting as a central. An attendee browser encapsulates the uh, CB Central Manager scanning for other devices. The gray circles over here, attendee advertiser, uh, those are peripherals. And each circle here is actually a separate iPhone. And they're broadcasting information, advertising information. In this case, they're advertising the Twitter handle that you put in. And so what the attendee browser is doing, it's scanning for attendee advertisers. And every time it finds one, it creates an attendee object. And that attendee object has different properties. One of them is um, uh, called RSSI, Receive Signal Strength, which is an indication of proximity. Bluetooth gives you a rough indication <coughs> of how close another Bluetooth device is to you. Um, <coughs> it's, it's not very uh, uh, fine or granulated, but it gives you a rough idea uh, how close something is to you. And, and so for every attendee object that's created, an attendee view object is created, and that's the circle that you see uh, bouncing up and down when you're looking at TWI in the Renaissance uh, conference app. So um, <coughs> you were right, 16 by 9 format. <laughs> uh, I formatted my slides as 4, uh, four by 3, so sorry for being cut off. But anyways, what we're looking at here is the delegate method for CB Central Manager. Uh, and this delegate method is called every time a new peripheral device is discovered. And so all we're doing here is we're getting the peripheral that's discovered, and we're looking to see, you know, is this uh, an attendee that I've already discovered? And if it is, we just update the proximity information, and we set... Uh, the age property of the attendee to zero. This is not your age, this is the representation of how long that attendee object has been visible. And um, if you wander out of the conference room um, and you're gone for more than eight seconds, the little circle and other people's uh, iPhone screens will disappear. And if it's um, a new attendee object, or new attend a new peripheral that's been discovered, we create a new attendee object and we add it to our array of attendees, and we uh, record what peripheral object it is, and we record the current uh, RSSI. And then we initiate a connection to it to get the uh, Twitter handle. So this, this really is the heart of the TWI application. This is where it all happens. So, um, as I mentioned, um, this is an open source project. Tim's included the um, open source to this in what he's doing with the Renaissance app. I have it set up as a separate project and a separate standalone app. And you can get it from uh, this link. Um, Alexian is my uh, GitHub account and Twee, and it's up there. Um, you can download it, you can run it. Uh, we've set up so it actually uses the same service UUID as the conference app. And so you'll actually see the exact same thing running this on, uh, it won't work on the Xcode simulator, but you can run it on your iPhone app and you'll, you'll see the same data that you will see uh, in the Renaissance conference app. So if it's okay with everybody, I have just one more thing that I want to mention. Um, Today is January 31st. 
This is the day that Google is shutting down Bump, or the Bump service. I don't know how many of you have used uh, Bump, but it was just a, a very easy way of uh, exchanging contact info. And the reason I bring this up is that I have uh, taken the ideas that I have um, in TWI and built on those and created a new app that I call Slip. And Slip is effectively bump, but without the bump. Uh, it's a very simple way to exchange contact information. And it um, became available on the App Store yesterday. And I'll show you a link on uh, how to get to it so you can download it and try it. I'm not going to give you a demo here because I'd prefer you to use it and try it out with somebody else that's here at the conference. But just very quickly, the way it works is once you both set up your contact info, you just bring your iPhones together. And if you see the same color and pattern on both phones, you know you've got a safe and secure connection. And then you just swipe up, and you both have each other's contact info. Really simple to use. Uh, I hope you all like it. And like I said, it's using a lot of the same concepts that are built into Twee. So here's the link for it, um, some contact information for myself. Thank you very much uh, for letting me speak here with you. All right, we're going to switch over some computers real quick here. And next up is going to be Kevin and Matt, who's going to show us some cool hardware that their company makes. And it's going to be stuff like you know these little eye beacons that I make. <laughs> All right. One second. Am I, am I on? You're on. <clears throat> All right. First of all, guys, as you can probably hear, I have a little bit of a cold today, but I've got some tea. I think we can make this work. So, all right, you still plugging in? Yeah, we're not. One second. Awesome. All right. You good to go? All right. All right. Please welcome Kevin and All right. Matt. Cool. Thank you, Scott. All right, guys. Uh, I want to talk to you today about Bluetooth Low Energy. Um, so my name is Kevin, and I'm working on a company called SenseCloud with Matt. I'm going to switch out with Matt here probably in about 15 minutes. And I'm going to focus on kind of more of the software part of things. Matt's going to come up. He's going to actually talk to you guys about some hardware. Um, so hopefully you guys will think that's interesting. Um, what we do is we are basically building indoor positioning systems for enterprise uh, use cases. So first thing I want to say about BLE is BLE is not Bluetooth. It shares the name. It's called Bluetooth Low Energy, but that's really about the only thing that it has in common with the Bluetooth that we all know and not really love. Um, so it's a subset. It's actually a subset of the Bluetooth 4 spec. Uh, but again, that's about the only thing that it shares with classic Bluetooth. Um, it actually requires different hardware support on the physical radio than like your older Bluetooth. So like Bluetooth 3 radios, they can't even talk BLE. Um, your Bluetooth 4 radios, they've got the hardware support on them so that they can. That's what's actually in all of your iDevices today. Um, another big difference is that there's no device pairing with BLE. Um, let me see if I can fix that. Um, so one of the really obnoxious things working with classic Bluetooth peripherals is you've got to go through this whole pairing process. Things just kind of auto-magically work with BLE. It's really nice. Um, one of the other differences is that with BLE, you get a lower data transfer rate. It's, uh, they spec it at around 100 kbps, although you're lucky if you get anywhere close to that, uh, realistically. Um, whereas classic Bluetooth, they say around 2 megabits per second. Um, but you really should not be pushing very much data over BLE. So 100 kbps is way more than it should, way more than you need. Um, so we already have a ton of wireless protocols today, right? We've got Wi-Fi and Zigbee, and NFC was supposed to be our payment, um, the, our payment protocol. I'm not sure what happened there. We've got RFID. We've already got regular Bluetooth. 
Sorry if this is giving anybody Caesars over here. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, okay, well, we'll, we'll work with it. Um, so what's the, why do we really need Bluetooth low energy? Well, if you kind of plot power usage versus uh, range, um, when you look at these different wireless protocols, it kind of starts to make a little bit of sense. The Zigbee and, and classic Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, they get great range, um, but they also use a lot of comparable power. NFC uses almost no power, but it also has almost no range. It's like 20 centimeters of range that you get with NFC. So BLE is actually, it kind of fits right in the middle where it's designed to use very little power, but you get a lot of range with it. So it's kind of this like kind of best of both worlds scenario where you can run this thing on a little battery for a really, really long time and actually still get a decent range off of it, which is really cool and opens up all sorts of new use cases. <clears throat> so that makes BLE a really good fit for situations where you have a device with very small data packets that you need to send. So like a temperature sensor or, you know, in the case of the Copenhagen uh, wheel, there's not really a whole ton of data that you're sending. I mean, how much data do you really need to say how fast your bike is going? A couple of bytes, right? So not a lot, and you don't need a big data transfer rate. So a few kbps is totally fine. And you really don't want to have to mess with this thing very often. You don't want to have to change batteries or recharge it. So coin cell battery operation is perfectly acceptable with BLE devices. And I mean, the great thing about having all these BLE radios and iDevices is these things easily talk to mobile. So that's great. And even Android devices are coming out with, uh, with um, BLE radios now, too. Um, I don't know if there's very many of those in this audience tonight. But um, here's a few products that use BLE. Um, Lexi did a great overview of some of them. Um, iBeacon is one that we've heard a lot about. The Shine is a, is a great fitness tracker. Um, to really understand BLE and how it works, there's kind of three things that you really need to understand. One, there's advertisements um, and services and characteristics. So um, the way this works is your BLE device is sitting there advertising itself. It's sending out a really small amount of data. It's saying, hey, look at me, I'm over here. It's kind of like your OkCupid okay dating profile. A little bit of information, just enough to make you actually want to interact. Um, and then once you see a device that you're interested in, you can start like probing its services. You can ask it, hey, what kind of services do you support? And once you find out this thing has some services you're interested in, you can connect to it, and then you can start interacting with these things called characteristics. So I'll go into a little bit more detail about what all of these things actually are. Um, so your advertisements, these are really small pieces of data. So this is kind of what a BLE advertisement looks like if you were to, pro, if you were to listen to this thing on the radio. Um, there's uh, not a whole lot of data going on here, and a lot of this is kind of used by the spec. You only get about 31 bytes that you can actually stick into your advertisement protocol. So you're new, you don't really have a whole lot to work with, um, which is totally fine. You don't really need a lot. And this thing is broadcasting you know, every few hundred milliseconds, uh, maybe a few seconds. There's kind of a trade-off you get there. If you're broadcasting a lot, you're going to burn your battery. If you're broadcasting every once in a while, it can be really difficult to discover your device. Um, but most things are broadcasting a few hundred milliseconds. So talking about services, services are kind of this encapsulation of something that you can do, right? So there is a spec for, I am a battery service. That means that you can ask me questions about my battery level. There are specs for, I'm a heart rate monitor. That means you can ask me about heart rates, and I know how to give you answers for that. Um, and there are all sorts of supported spec down services. Um, that you can go onto the GATT website and there's all sorts of XML documents that, you know, if you're ever looking for something really exciting to read through, you can go out and take a look at. Um, the, uh, the services that are kind of spec'd out, these guys have uh, kind of 16-bit service IDs. You can invent your own services that do whatever you want them to do and you can spec them out. Uh, yours will have 128-bit service IDs though. Um, so let's take just a quick look at the heart rate service. And so I mentioned characteristics earlier. Once you know that a device has a service that you're interested in, you want to be able to interact and ask it, ask it questions. So for the heart rate service, for example, we've got three different what's called characteristics that we can probe. 
Um, if you look at the requirement for each of these, only two of them is actually, or I'm sorry, only one of them is actually mandatory. The other two are optional, which means if you're implementing a heart rate monitor, you really only have to implement one of these. You can optionally implement these other ones too. Um, and so these different characteristics, there's different types. So there are some of them that you can read, which makes total sense, right? You can ask, uh, ask what, what is your heart rate? You can probe a temperature sensor and say, what is the temperature? Um, some of them you can write to, so you can actually change data on the device. The Copenhagen wheel, again, is a great example. I wish that I had used that in my slide because I think it's a great product. Um, so you can write to this thing and say, hey, I want you to lock, right? Change your, I don't know what, I'm locked characteristic to true. And then you could probably read from it later to check and see if it's locked and then write to it again. Um, the heart rate is actually a really interesting characteristic and in it's called a notify characteristic. So what you can actually do with notify characteristics is you can subscribe for push notifications from the BLE device. So rather than constantly asking this BLE device, hey, is the heart rate different? What have you got? You get a new heart rate? You can just say notify me when you have a new heart rate. And then this BLE device automatically broadcasts every, on whatever interval, every time that value changes, automatically pushes that to you. So, I mean, one of the reasons they did this is to cut down on radio chatter, right? This helps save battery power um, on both sides. So there's a lot of, well, when you dig into the stuff, it's actually really interesting what they've done to um, make the battery life as, as good as possible. So um, Alexa talks a little bit about how things work on the iOS side. I'll kind of skip over, I've got some overlap. I'll kind of breeze through it here. But um, yeah, core Bluetooth is how you interact with BLE on, a mo on your iOS device. Um, you've got peripherals, you've got centrals. Your centrals are typically things like your iPhones and your, and your iPads and your laptops, the things that want to connect to devices. Your peripherals are the things that you want to connect to, like your Copenhagen wheels and your temperature sensors and your heart rate monitors. Um, and this is kind of hierarchically how these things are structured. You've got your peripheral. Your peripheral has services that it implements, and then a service is made up of characteristics, which are values that you can read and write from. Um, so here's a little bit of code. Just kind of breeze through this too. Central manager, this is a guy that you use to, um, to actually start looking for, for peripherals. You can say scan for peripherals with services and then pass in the ID of the service that you're interested in. Then you get a call back into your delegate and to discover peripheral. You get some cool information. Um, one of the things you get is this advertisement data dictionary, which, you know, earlier when we looked at the advertisement packet, the 37 or 31 bytes that you get to put stuff in, that's what ends up getting stuffed into this dictionary here for you. So it's a really easy way of, of accessing the data that's in those, uh, in those packets. Um, you also get the RSSI value, um, which is received signal strength indicator. We'll look at that a little bit um, in just a few minutes when we talk about iBeacon too. So, uh, once you have found a device that you're interested in, uh, you want to discover its services. So then you use the central manager again to do discover services. And it's, you're going to get another callback and it did discover services. And you get this array of all the services that are implemented. You can go through those, find the one that you're interested in. Um, and then you can start interacting with characteristics. Here's a quick example of the heart rate monitor. Um, here I've subscribed for notifications every time the heart rate value changes. And I'm going to get a call into did update value for characteristic. And again, this is like a push notification coming from the BLE device saying, hey, your heart rate has changed. Here's a new value. Um, cool. So I want to talk about iBeacons. iBeacons are in the news a lot. There's um, a lot of companies doing interesting things with them. Um, we're all going to, this, this holiday season, I, I predict that we're all going to get tons of iBeacon push notifications when we're shopping in the mall. Um, it's, it's inevitable. These things are rolling out all over the place. Macy's has already rolled out iBeacons. Um, they're American Eagle, tons of places are doing this. So what is iBeacon? It's essentially an indoor proximity technology. I'm going to separate that a little bit from location. Um, because it doesn't really plot you on a map per se. Um, when you look at the core location uh, APIs for it, you see basically what you get is you're near a beacon, or now you're not near a beacon, or you're kind of close to this beacon, that sort of thing. Um, but it doesn't really help you plot on a map necessarily. Uh, but it's still great for tons of use cases like, uh, like retail advertising. Um, these are advertisement-only BLE devices. So they're broadcasting 
over BLE channels, but you can't connect to them. They don't implement any services. They don't have any characteristics you can read data from. They're just sending out some data packets. They're advertising on some frequency. And all your phones are doing is just listening for these things. Um, so here's how this works. Uh, so core Bluetooth is how you connect to Bluetooth devices and do interesting things with peripherals. Core location is what you use for interacting with iBeacons. And so what you'll do in core location is you use this thing called location manager, and you go and instantiate a beacon region, and then you tell your location manager, I want you to start monitoring for this region, and you give it an ID for the, the iBeacons that you're interested in. You start getting callbacks for did enter region and did exit region. So you, know, you can set up something here where you get an enter region for your iBeacon, and you can push a notification to somebody to tell them to buy sweaters. Um, so earlier, we, we kind of looked at what the advertisement packets looked like on the airwaves for uh, Bluetooth low energy. Um, so let's just take a look at iBeacon and how iBeacon is actually taking this and implementing their own protocol on top of it. So you can see here what they've done with this payload, these 31 some odd bytes that you get. They get to break this down into some other, some of their own protocol here where you've got an Apple preamble up there with some data in it. Um, and then kind of here near the end, these last four chunks, these are the things that you're actually kind of interested in. So you get this thing called uh, an application UUID, um, a major and minor, as well as your transmit power as well. Um, so what these things actually are, your application UUID, um, which is 16 bytes long, gets, this differentiates your iBeacons from Estimode's iBeacons versus Shopkick's iBeacons versus whoever else's. So you can have tons of people's iBeacons in the same place without them really stepping on each other and, and interfering with everybody else's applications. So again, when you're, when you're telling core location to look out for iBeacons, you have to tell it this application ID. Um, one, an interesting experiment that I tried was, well, what if I give it like a nil UID? Will it listen to all of the iBeacons? And it turns out that it won't. It won't actually do anything for you. So currently, iOS, you have to specifically say, I'm looking for an iBeacon with this, uh, this application ID. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure they do that on purpose. And so you've probably got tons of your own iBeacons too with your application ID on all of them. Um, and what you want to be able to do is also differentiate your iBeacons, each one from every other iBeacon that you own. You've got iBeacon 1, iBeacon 10, you know, however how many iBeacons you've got. You've got one in the sweater department, one in the socks department, that sort of thing. So that's what the major and minor values are for. So this is basically four bytes of addressing that you get for your iBeacons. So again, the, this UUID separates your iBeacons from everybody else's. The major and minor separates your iBeacons from all of your other iBeacons. Um, and then this TX power up here, this is the um, transmit power that this advertisement data was sent. And so then what iBeacon does is it takes that value and it looks at, well, what, what did I receive this signal at? Um, and then it does a little bit of math. There's, figured I'd throw, it's maybe a little early for a math slide, but figured I'd give it a shot. Um, but here's a little bit of math, how it actually figures out how close you are to this iBeacon. Um, and it's very rough, right? Like there's a lot of things that interfere with the signal. Um, and I'll actually give you guys a quick demo of this here in just a minute. Um, it's kind of rough, but it gives you a pretty good idea of where, you know, kind of what, are you close to this thing? Are you kind of far from it? That sort of thing. So um, let me actually, so I'm going to switch over. This is the last part of my presentation. And then I'll uh, bring Matt up here to talk a little bit about hardware. Um, so I'm actually going to do a quick demo. And the interesting thing about this iBeacon protocol and proximity is you can do it with regular BLE advertisements. Um, you don't have to use Apple's protocol. So I actually have an example here. I call it beaconless because it's not using iBeacon. It's just using uh, BLE advertisements. And um, so I'll just take a, I'll just drive very quickly through this code here um, and just show you guys what it does. So I, I spin up this thing called a central manager and I'm scanning for, uh, let's see, scanning for peripherals here and I get all these did discover callbacks. 
And then what I'm doing is I'm looking at the RSSI value of these callbacks, and then I'm basically running that math that I did earlier. And down here, I, I you know, did a little bit of measurement to figure out what's the TX uh, signal strength for an iPhone. And then once you've got that, you can do some math to kind of figure out you know, how far am I from this thing actually. So um, I'm just gonna spin up this example here. And I've got a beacon transmitter on my iPhone. So as I walk away from this thing, we should see that number get a little bit bigger. There we go, okay, cool, yeah. So it's a little bit rough, but like you can see, I mean, this is just using regular BLE advertisements, um, with not using your standard iBeacon. You can get, you can do proximity without, uh, without iBeacon. So um, anyway, that is, that concludes my portion of this demo, of this, this presentation. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Matt here. Um, where, so the, this beaconless code, if you're interested in that, it's up on GitHub github.com slash sensecloud.io. Um, there's my Twitter and my email if you wanna ask me any questions. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Matt here and he's gonna talk to you guys about hardware stuff, which is awesome. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Oh, man. I wanted to apologize again about the uh, flickering on the screen. I was having a little kind of frequency issues, but uh, if you guys check out the video later, uh, there won't be any issues on that. Um, so let's talk about Bluetooth hardware, BLE hardware. What would you find in one of these devices? And here's an example of a beacon. What, what do you find in this? There's a couple components. The big one is, of course, the radio and microcontroller. The current, a little loud. The current generation devices are really integrated, so the companies realize that in order to hit uh, the power uh, constraints and to make devices small, that everything should be integrated. So they have microcontrollers, they have the radio, they have peripherals for interfacing with sensors, other external physical systems. Um, so that's the biggest part of it. And then of course you have an antenna. Um, what good is a, is a radio if you can't propagate that signal to another device, to a phone, uh, to a peer device? Uh, you'll have some kind of power source um, for wearables, small designs, beacons, it's some kind of battery. Um, if you're in something like the, uh, the wheel, this motorized bicycle, you're going to have very powerful batteries. Uh, and then there's any kind of value-added peripherals. So this could be sensors, maybe an accelerometer to tell if you're moving, maybe some feedback from a motor. Uh, it could be an LED just to indicate some event, um, anything that interfaces with the external world. So in this uh, diagram, you can see we have a little tiny chip antenna in this example. Um, you have then a radio section, some circuits supporting the radio, and of course a battery. So where do you get these BLE microcontroller SOCs? So there's three major vendors. Um, they make very great devices. They all have kind of unique features. So depending what you're trying to build, um, you're going to want to choose one or the other. So TI, they are kind of the first one to the field. They're the most established. They have the most designs shipping uh, in production now. Um, what's good about that is that the community is really well developed. There's a lot of developers out there with the experience um, with these devices. And they also provide a lot of reference designs. They've been around longer, so they've been putting a lot of effort into enabling uh, device makers to, to develop for them. Uh, now, a newcomer to the field is a Nordic Semiconductor. So their um, biggest feature is a kind of high-performance microprocessor controller, microcontroller core. And so if you're doing any application that needs a little more processing, maybe needs to read more sensors faster, maybe needs to do some simple mathematic manipulation on the device, um, it's a really good option. Uh, it's also really low power. Um, they uh, have very, very well... Um, they put a lot of effort into optimizing their design for uh, low power states. It also has a kind of longer range radio than, than TI has. So for something like an iBeacon where you want to get maximum coverage, it could be a, a major influencer. Um, really new to the field is CSR. I think they've made their announcement sometime in the last two to three months. As far as I know, there's no production design shipping from them. Um, but it's Prom it's very promising uh, in the early days. It's a very low cost. Um, they're targeting much lower bomb costs than both TI and uh, Nordic. And it has a very high power radio. So I think we may see a, a flood of beacons based on the, the CSR design, uh, probably towards the end of the year or um, Q3. 
Um, but what I would caution if you're planning on developing a new device um, is that it is a very young ecosystem. There aren't a lot of developers out there using it. Um, the company is still kind of establishing themselves in the market. Manufacturers won't have the experience working with their parts and their chips, so um, it could be some concerns about time to market. Um, but that's only a short-term concern. So what about antennas? What kind of antennas might you see in in these kinds of designs, mobile devices. So the cheapest kind is called a PCB trace antenna, and it's just a really carefully designed strip of metal um, laid out on a circuit board. You can see one in this uh, image on the left. And so what's great about them is they're really, really cheap. They're effectively free as long as you have the space to fit them. Um, drawback that they have is that the, the radiation from these devices isn't exactly consistent. So if you wanted to say, try to do a location-based system based on radio signals. Um, there's going to be weaker signals going in some direction, so it's going to be difficult to uh, have a reliable um, system built like that. Another option is a ceramic chip antenna. These are fairly new, new technology. They're using a similar kind of technique, really small, carefully laid out and designed wires on a small substrate. Um, their biggest advantage is that they're really, really tiny. So if you're trying to make something like a Fitbit, a Nike fuel band, something with not a lot of space, uh, you can get a pretty reliable, pretty, um, pretty good antenna in a tiny area. Um, they also have a really good radiation pattern. So if you're, again, wanting to build some kind of proximity system that has consistency across the entire field, that's a really good option. Um, a third, third option, of course, an external antenna. We've all seen these on walkie-talkies, radios. Um, it could be an option for some maybe niche applications for BLE, maybe a ruggedized outdoor beacon, or maybe you want a beacon to cover a stadium, uh, something where a, where a standard device wouldn't be having. Um, so those are available. They're, there's a lot of limitations with them. When you get these kinds of devices certified, you need the radio certified with the device itself, so you can't say make and, make and sell a beacon with interchangeable um, antenna types. Uh, the FCC is not too, not too happy about that kind of thing. So what about batteries? Um, what kind of batteries are you going to typically see in these devices? So for BLE specifically, because it's so low energy, uh, coin cells are a really good option. Um, if you have kind of low, low uh, frequency, low data rate communications, you can have a coin cell battery, which is really small power device for months, even years. Um, so they're a really, really good option. They're really small. Uh, you may see the standard alkaline uh, cylindrical cells, you know, your double A's, your triple A's. These are great because they're ubiquitous. They're cheap. They're the most produced batteries in existence. Um, they have maybe 5 to 10x the capacity of a coin cell. So if you wanted a, a beacon that would last uh, for a longer period of time or be able to advertise more frequently to improve the quality of, of service, they're a really good option. And then uh, another type of battery you commonly see is a, just a lithium ion or lithium polymer pouch cell. These are great for rechargeable devices, so you'll see them in a lot of wearables, your Fitbits, your Pebble type devices. Um, they're great because they're, they're rechargeable. There's a little extra cost, um, so compared to say a beacon application, you probably wouldn't want a, a polymer type battery because it's impractical to recharge uh, and the costs are higher than just replacing a, a battery every month, couple months or every year. So what does a typical BLE device cost? You know, what does it cost to make, make these things? So a very basic design, just the radio, nothing else. I mean, you're talking three to four dollars. So that breaks down maybe a dollar fifty to two dollars depending on the volume for the microcontroller, the SOC parts of the device. Um, you need some, what's called a crystal oscillator, which is used to set a reference for the radio uh, to make sure you can communicate at the right frequency with your, with your iPhone. Some supporting components uh, for the radio itself. Uh, the antenna, this example would say, what would it cost to have this ceramic chip antenna? Maybe about 20 cents um, at high volume. And then some cheap, simple, uh, low-tech PCBs. Uh, 25 cents or less. So you're talking about 350 uh, for a baseline BLE design. But there's always a catch. Um, like hardware, there's a lot of high upfront costs. So yeah, you can make these really cheap in unit volumes once you hit 5 to 10K, once you're shipping tons of them. Um, but before you get there, you have to pay. You have to pay to 
create molds, to make casings, you have to pay for radio certification so you can sell these legally so you're not uh, disrupting critical services. Uh, and those will run you um, many thousands of dollars. So how would you get started? Uh, if you want to mess around with Beely hardware, Beely type devices, all the three major vendors he talked about have great dev kits available for about $100. That'll get you to the point where you can start developing code that would run on one of these devices, um, interfacing external sensors, implementing custom Beely protocols on the device side. Uh, if you're more interested in just the app side of development, Texas Instrument has a great platform called the Sensor Tag. It's a little $25 dev kit, and it has a BLE radio and a ton of sensors, like an accelerometer, a uh, magnetometer, a gyroscope, uh, IR temperature sensor. So you can read all that data uh, from the iPhone, and it uh, could be a great development platform for, uh, for app development. So again, I'm, I'm Matt Baker. Feel free to contact me if you want to find out more. And uh, you can check out our GitHub for some of our example applications. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Matt. We're going to do, again, a real quick switch over here. And yeah, now we're going to talk about watches and some cool stuff. You might be seeing people running around with pebbles or their new steel one, which is really cool. So Martin here's going to tell us all about it. And sorry about the flickering on the last one from, this, uh, from the other computer. On the video, if you do watch it, it will look good. So when you rewatch it, because all of that really good information, you want to see all that code again, uh, it'll look fine. Sorry about that. Right. So thank you, Scott. Please welcome Mark. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Mark Titan. I'm a uh, software engineer at uh, Pebble Technology. We're uh, uh, in Palo Alto. Um, some of you might know us from uh, those devices that you see up there. That's uh, our product. Uh, it's called Pebble, like the company. Um, I, in my presentation, I'd like to um, talk a bit about Pebble like as a journey. Um, I've joined uh, almost two years ago now, and it's been quite a roller coaster, um, it being a pretty successful pro uh, product so far. Um, I'll, like a lot of the technical stuff has already been covered by previous presenters, so I'll kind of breeze through that. Um, in the end, I'll talk a bit about uh, our SDK and kind of our strategy towards connecting uh, the pebble to, you know, whatever you want to connect to it to. So, um, so let's start. So I'll breeze through this quickly. Um, connected objects, what's the fuss about? Um, I've have, I have a slide here that's from um, Apple's, uh, one of Apple's WWDC presentations, which I uh, strongly recommend watching if you're uh, into iOS um, development. Um, this is kind of the projection of, uh, sorry about the cutoff, by the way. This is sort of the projection of um, BLE devices um, in the world. We're about the, the billion uh, point right now, which is uh, quite a lot. Um, we've uh, seen these things. Um, I mean, the Shine, uh, Locketron, BLE enabled door lock uh, with inks. Um, so, um, a lot of things in the coming years are getting connected to internet, to your phone, to each other, device to device, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's what it's all about. Um, one of the previous presenters already gave a really nice overview of the uh, connectivity technologies. I think these are kind of the uh, prevalent ones at the moment. Uh, there's, of course, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, classic, and uh, Bluetooth. Uh, low energy or smart or 4.0, it's kind of the same thing. Um, to quickly give a comparison, um, why you would choose one or the other, um, Wi-Fi is uh, a lot of devices that are uh, wired, uh, like laptops and such, 
um, they they use Wi-Fi. Um, it's it's kind of a power hungry uh, protocol compared to the other ones, uh, as you saw in the previous slides. Um, and on your device, you'll need a uh, IP stack, uh, which is a, quite a large chunk of software that you need. So if you're talking about really small, cheap devices, that's really not an option. Um, going to Bluetooth Classic, uh, downside there is pairing is, is, is sort of a, a, ha a hassle for the end consumer. Um, you have to uh, make the devices connect to each other, do a handshake. Uh, there's all kinds of obstacles there. Um, we see in our support requests, like number one uh, question is basically, I cannot pair. There's a problem with my pairing. Um, we're using, by the way, we're using Bluetooth Classic and LE in, uh, in Pebble. Um, upside of Bluetooth Classic is there, there are a lot of um, prevalent profiles in a lot of devices already, like the iPhone. I'll, I'll talk about it later in the slides. Uh, there are a lot of profiles in iOS and in Android that are supported um, right off the bat. So you can just tap into those uh, APIs, which is uh, really nice. Um, on, uh, in terms of complexity, uh, Bluetooth Classic uh, also requires the device uh, to be a little more beefy. Um, the stack is much com more complex than uh, Bluetooth Smart. Um, and then lastly, uh, with iOS, there is the possibility to tap into Apple's Made for iPhone program. Um, and then in your iOS app, you get to use a framework called External Accessory Framework. Um, the, uh, if you're making a device or if you're thinking about that, that's certainly an option. I would not really recommend it because you have to jump through a lot of hoops and certifications with Apple uh, before you get that actually in place and the framework itself is not that great. Uh, I, if, if possible for your application or your device that you want to make, I'd certainly uh, look at Bluetooth uh, low energy first. Um, pairing is optional with uh, Bluetooth Smart. Uh, for some services, it's required. Um, much more lower energy, simpler stack, it's much lower, and it's uh, been around a couple of years now since the iPhone 4S. All right, so now I'll, I'll uh, give you a short uh, overview of kind of the history of, of, of Pebble because I think it's a pretty inspiring tale and a lot of people have you know, ideas of their own uh, for uh, devices and, and exciting new things. And I think Pebble is really a good example of how one person can have an idea uh, and you know, go towards actually having you know, the whole world buy your stuff. And, I don't know, it's, uh, it's pretty cool, I think. Um, so this is, this is Eric uh, about five years ago when he was still a student. This is shot with his laptop in his student dorm. Um, and he was fooling around with um, like uh, Nokia parts. You might recognize the Nokia screen there. Um, and he, made, he had the idea uh, for a watch while he was biking. He loves to bike. Uh, and he, and he uh, just bought a new phone. Like he bought the new iPhone. He was like, oh shit, I'm biking and now I'm receiving a text message. I don't want to take my phone out of my pocket because I'm afraid I'll drop it. So he came up with the idea of what if I could you know, glance on my watch and see my text message there. So he started hacking in his, uh, in his spare time and he created this thing which he called the Watch Duino. Um, if you're familiar with Arduino, this is like his twist upon, uh, on Arduino. He basically took the internals from the Arduino development board uh, put Bluetooth module on there and a screen and he had like a big huge watch Duino. So that was the first prototype basically for, uh, for a smartwatch that he made. Um, shortly after that uh, he cobbled together a couple people and started to work on this product. It's called Impulse. It's, um, Impulse was the company that Pebble was before it was Pebble. Uh, they were in Waterloo in Canada, where, uh, where he studied also, Eric, and this, this failed. Uh, it was only BlackBerry. It did have a color display, which we don't have at the moment, but uh, it was only BlackBerry. I think that was you know, one, one, one thing that uh, wasn't a good idea at that time. Uh, 
it, uh, the battery lasted only a day or so, a little less than a day. Uh, the, the software itself, it was not really an OS. So if you, for example, there, there, was a, there was an SDK and people were making apps for it. But if you would want to install somebody else's app, you're basically rewriting the whole, uh, you know, the whole system again. So for example, it would ship with a notifications app. But if you would want to use, I don't know, the Twitter app, then you would wipe out the notification app and you just have the, the Twitter app. So there were a lot of problems there. Um, didn't go that well. But it did get them into Y Combinator, the um, incubator in Mountain View here. So Eric moved his team to a Y Combinator. Initially, they were very interested in the product. Um, at the end of the Y Combinator program, they did not um, succeed in raising enough money to you know, go through the next iteration. Um, so they were running out of money, but one thing was really clear. They had, not, they had to abandon BlackBerry and go to iOS and Android. Um, so with literally the last dollars in the bank, uh, they were like, okay, what to do now? So this, what they, this is what they did. They put their project on, on Kickstarter and um, surprise, surprise, it blew up. It was amazing. Um, when the counter was about uh, two million something, um, I got a call from Eric and uh, he was slightly, he was very euphoric but also slightly panicky. <laughs> uh, and uh, um, that's when I joined. He, he, he was, at that time, there were just five people and uh, only three engineers. Uh, so um, he called up all his friends and, 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 and contacts and uh, asked everybody to, to join Pebble. <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, that was May, let's see. That was April, May 2012. Um, we shipped, we started shipping January uh, 2013, and uh, last month we sold over th uh, 300,000 uh, of these devices, which I, I think is, uh, is amazing. Um, um, in May 2013, so shortly after we started shipping, um, we, we shipped a, a proof of, we called it a proof of concept SDK. It was very rough, it was not, ready yet. Um, I, I had a hard time uh, letting Eric convince me to actually ship it because it's, it, I think it was really bad. But we did it anyway um, because we needed feedback. We needed to learn from, okay, what, what should this SDK be? Um, so what we shipped basically included this stuff. Um, we called it the Watch App SDK. It, uh, it was a C, uh, C SDK, so you would write bare C low-level programs that you could uh, put on the Pebble alongside other apps, so it wasn't a full replacement. Um, it had a bunch of UI widgets, sort of like UIKit, um, uh, but then just the, you know, uh, much more uh, smaller version of that. It had a graphics library, sort of like core graphics, but again, much smaller than that. Um, access to the vibration motor in the device, access to the backlight, and phone app connectivity. That's, that's sort of the proof of concept that we ship with. And what happened was, was uh, pretty cool. Uh, a lot of people loved it. They, they pointed, obviously they pointed out all the, all the holes and the, the things that were wrong with it, but people just ran with it and started making all kinds of, all kinds of things. Um, really, yeah, blew us away. Um, so here are just some examples, people making QR code apps, um, music players, all kinds of things. Um, Bitcoin app. Um, because we were still ab around 10 people back then, uh, we didn't have the resources to make a fully fledged app store and things like that. So um, we also said to people, okay, if you want to make an app store, go ahead. So that happened. Like people made app stores, um, even paid ones, funnily. Um, and another person made uh, a watch face generator for people that don't know how to program. They could just like put in different things like the background, do want to have hands or digital time, what fonts, et cetera, et cetera. And they could just hit a button and they would get a watch face. Uh, so that they generated one, more than uh, 150,000 watch faces in, uh, in less than a year. Um, 
some more uh, happy pictures. People with pebbles. And now um, we're, we just launched this one. This is uh, the second iteration of, of the Pebble. Uh, it's a steel, a steel watch. It's actually manufactured also by a watchmaker. That's pretty cool. Um, the technology inside is more or less the same as in the, in the first one. Um, we, like one of our goals is to create a stable platform. So we don't wanna like, you know, uh, change all the APIs one day or another. We did that recently with uh, going from the proof of concept API to the 2.0 API, but the proof of concept API had a clear warning that says we're going to break this. So I think that was okay. But we want to make it stable. So this one, you can write apps for the old Pebble. They will work. They will work on the new one. Um, and we got a really glowing review from from The Verge. Um, that uh, yeah, it was great. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the platform because as an iOS developer or Android developer, mobile app developer, you, uh, we provide a bunch of APIs that allow you to connect um, the Pebble to your app and have your app push information to the Pebble and back. Um, so basically this is what the Pebble is in terms of specs. Um, there's an outdoor readable display. It has four buttons. Uh, the one on the left is the back one. Uh, top and bottom are usually used for scrolling or paging through stuff. And then the middle one is select. There's a vibration motor. So you'll, you can, I don't know, if you, if you send a notification or something, you can make it vibrate. Uh, there are a couple sensors. There's an accelerometer for which we have APIs. There is a uh, like a compass sensor, which currently we don't have an API for yet, uh, hopefully soon. Um, there's an ambient backlight sensor which will automatically make the display uh, lit, light up, uh, which, for which there is also no API, by the way. Um, in terms of the processing uh, power, there's an ARM Cortex M3, uh, 128K RAM, 4 megs of flash storage. In the new one, it's, it's uh, 8. Uh, the display itself is 144 by 168. And we have Bluetooth Classic and LE, so it's dual dual mode. Um, and our target is five to seven days battery life. But what is it really? It's a tiny computer on a wrist. It's um, internet connected. Um, you can have it connect to third-party native apps, um, integrate with phone apps. Uh, it comes with a bunch of built-in things like music. You can control. Um, your, the music that's playing on your phone, so you can see what's, what the song title is, the album, et cetera, and you can decide to pause, skip, et cetera. Uh, there's an alarm app, obviously, as a watch. Um, you can see incoming phone, phone calls. You can decide to reject them or accept them. There's no audio, so you can't, the audio will be routed to whatever you, you have uh, plugged in. Uh, you'll receive messages, email. And um, a new thing, that uh, we're launching really soon is uh, the Pebble App Store. So finally, we uh, uh, have our own App Store inside our app. Uh, and we have actually a developer portal and things like that where people can submit apps. Uh, so this will make it really easy for your app to get discovered by, by our users. Um, this is going to be out really soon, as in next week, probably. Um, so some examples um, of new things that people made for the, the new Pebble and the new SDK. Uh, Foursquare made an app. Uh, it's really simple. You, you open the app. The, f the only thing you can do basically is check in. Uh, it's like check in in one second. Um, this one is pretty cool too. It's, the photo is a little poor. Uh, I'm sorry for that. Uh, this is the Pebble Mars app. Uh, this, if you shake your wrist, it will, you will get the latest uh, photograph from the Curiosity rover on your wrist. I don't know, it's, it's just amazing that you get this picture from, from Mars. Um, um, Pandora also made an app. This is uh, the Yelp app. It's a little more elaborate than the Foursquare. You can actually find things around you and things, and you can get reviews. It's pretty useful. This one I saw last week. I'm not sure if I can. So somebody made a Nest app. 
pretty awesome. Change your, so you can just walk around and then you bloop, change the temperature. So, okay, enough about that. Um, I'll go on now to talk a bit about what underlying technologies we've been using and kind of what our approach was in order to create all this and um, what our, basically our, our connectivity strategy is. Uh, so we, we sort of thought, okay, we could make a device that's, that's super beefy, uh, can connect to 3G or LTE even maybe, um, but then you need a lot of horsepower. The device will be more exp very expensive and basically you'll end up with a phone, right? Um, so we decided to go the other way because a lot of, um, well, the trend what you see is that CPU makers, um, they focus a lot on what goes into mobile phones because the volume is so large. Um, and what you see is that the battery capacity doesn't increase a lot. Like over time, the, the increment in CPU cycles that you get per second is much higher than battery uh, increase. So there's a lot of focus in doing more with the same big battery that's in your phone and not so much in making the battery smaller. So that means for us that we have to basically stick with, with processing power that's like from 10 years ago, so to speak. Um, so we just have to accept that. Um, as a result, our, our strategy becomes, okay, we're gonna lean heavily on Bluetooth. We have no IP stack, which means we cannot directly connect to the internet. Um, and we have to use the smartphone as the gateway to the cloud. Um, and as a result, we have a pretty low cost device. Pebble is like 150 bucks for the cheapest model. Um, um, so in terms of, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know a better name. I call it OS connectivity strategy. Um, like the core functionality, uh, so media controls, getting push notifications, being able to answer your phone. Uh, for those things, we tap into a couple of Bluetooth profiles that both iOS and Android provide in, uh, to a certain degree. Um, I'll go through them quickly so you kind of have an idea. Um, so there's this thing called hands-free profile. That's a Bluetooth uh, classic profile. It does not use slow energy, um, which gives you a lot of information of who's calling. It gives you caller control. You can see, like, um, you can, uh, you get ring events, you get the name, uh, and you don't have to go, like you don't even have to have an app, basically. These APIs are all there, and they're made for things like uh, uh, car kits and, uh, and such. Um, for the audio control and then the metadata, we use AVRCP. Uh, same deal, Bluetooth Classic Profile is in iOS, ships with it, you don't need an app, you can just tap into it uh, as a device. Um, for iMessage and SMS on iOS 6, we, we have been using um, MAP, Message Access Profile. It's, um, it, uh, it allows you to get the iMessage and SMS. It's not that great. It's, it's kind of a hassle to set up. Um, on iOS 7, Apple shipped with uh, Apple Notification Center service, which uh, is an LE service. Um, it's, it's one of the first, I think, that actually is in, uh, baked into the uh, iOS. And this gives us access to all push notifications. So any app that sends a local notification or a push notification will be routed to Pebble, uh, which is great for us. Uh, lastly, um, we're using serial port profile. And uh, on top of that, uh, the MFI profile uh, protocols. So serial port profile is basically just emulation of a serial port. There's a standard Bluetooth classic profile for that. Apple ad adds a bunch of protocols on top of that to basically to route data from different apps uh, and multiplex them over the same channel. Um, and we use that for things like software updates, application installation, um, setting the time, things basically that, are, that there weren't uh, profiles for for time. There's now the time profile also in iOS 7. Um, uh, so yeah, 
kind of the, the, the summary is we're currently using mostly Bluetooth Classic profiles just because there is no alternative for some of these. Um, for example, there is no baked-in uh, profile in iOS. Uh, there's no baked-in LE profile in iOS to get uh, music metadata and things like that. Um, call control, same, same deal. There's no LE profile. Um, and we don't use uh, the personal area network. There's that personal area network is another pro profile that basically gives you direct uh, internet access. That's what, uh, for example, your laptop uses if you use uh, tethering. Um. <clears throat> so um, in terms of connecting uh, apps, because that's probably what you're more interested in, um, we basically have two approaches here. One is uh, a direct connection between whatever you write for the Pebble and your native phone app. So you, we, we, uh, an example for, uh, is uh, RunKeeper. Um, the Pebble connects with, with RunKeeper. The integration is uh, that RunKeeper connects directly to the Pebble. It uh, can send uh, things like pace, time, distance uh, directly to, to it and vice versa, button clicks are sent directly back to the Pebble, uh, sorry, to the OneKeeper app for, to pause or resume your, your activity. And uh, in order to make this a little easier, uh, we've built phone app libraries. So if you go to developer.getpebble.com, you can download an iOS library or an Android library, plug it into your app, and then directly uh, talk to Pebble. Um, it's so a static library. We use Bluetooth and MFI directly for iOS. It's uh, iPhone 4 or later, iOS 6 or later. Androids, it's, uh, you get a Java source library. It uses the intent bus, and the Pebble app acts as a proxy, and uh, compatible with Android 2, 3, 3 or later. Second strategy is something new in, in the latest SDK. Um, we heard from a lot of, lot of developers that they necess don't necessarily want to make a native app. Um, and we also saw that people were making a native app because they wanted to connect to Pebble, which resulted in a whole slew of apps that were just a little shell with a button that says connect to Pebble and nothing else. Um, so for these use cases, we, so basically I just want to connect to API XYZ on the web. Uh, I don't want to make a native app. For these use cases, we came up with the following. Um, basically use the Pebble phone app as a proxy to your web service. And we do that by allowing you as a developer to write a little piece of JavaScript that gets executed by the Pebble app on behalf of your watch app. So you write a watch app, you write a little piece of JavaScript, you bundle it up, you load it up, and it all works. That's, that's kind of the idea. You no, don't need to na make a native app. Um, Things like settings, login. Um, for example, if you, if you make a Facebook app, you need to log in somewhere. And we don't have a keyboard here, and you don't want to type on this thing. Um, so for those things, you can uh, have the Pebble app present a piece of UI on behalf of your Watch app, too. Um, last thing that's pretty cool is that we get to utilize, or you get to utilize all the, or a couple of the sensors from the phone, uh, primarily the geolocation. So um, you have the GPS axis in your Pebble app. Um, yeah. Wrap up. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, I'll skip this. Um, obvious question, I think, is uh, can we connect from a Pebble app directly to other BLE devices? Currently, we cannot. Um, we hope to provide this functionality pretty soon. Same with Pebble to Pebble, same with Pebble to iBeacons. Um, sorry to say that, um, but uh, we're working on it. So uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was my story. Um, one last thing, if you're interested in like hacking on hardware, I recommend this stuff. It's a really cheap development board. It's like 20 bucks. Um, it's called Cortado. So that's it. Thank you. So uh, well, our back our presenters here, and we have a minute or two for questions, and that's about it. So if anybody got a quick question on Bluetooth, 
hardware, cool stuff. So many questions for all of you, so I'll just ask a g generic question, which is, um, what do you see missing in Bluetooth LE that you'd love to have in order to push it to the next level for each of you? I'll, I'll say network connectivity. I mean, one, I mean, this is kind of one of the obvious pieces of Pebbles talking about how hard it is to get up to the cloud, right? Even if you have something that's sitting in your home, <clears throat> getting network connectivity, getting something up and back from the cloud is actually really painful. You're seeing a lot of companies that are building BLE products that are also building BLE radio plus Wi-Fi radio to get things back and forth. So they're building like a base station. So that's really painful. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, totally agree. Like, as you can see in the presentation, the phone is really the, the hub at the moment. And that's really the trend. Like, I mean, we could try to fight that. But yeah, I think we just have to go along with that. There, there are some. Uh, advancements in the Bluetooth SIG. I saw there is like a REST uh, Bluetooth LE profile that they're working on. That might be interesting like, to be able to access REST APIs on the web directly, but who knows how long that will take. Yeah, and there, there's some interesting things in the Bluetooth 4.1 spec, which I think was just finalized um, just a few weeks ago, or may, maybe, Sorry. yeah, it was just very recent. Um, <clears throat> and they're starting to add in support for like star network configurations, and the ability to kind of like do addressing across BLE networks. So it's not gonna be TCP IP or anything like that, but it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. I think that they recognize those issues and they're working on it. Yeah, I look forward to a IPv6 address space for all my <laughs> on BLE. <laughs> um, so a major problem in the Wi-Fi world is in congested areas like New York City, they're out of bandwidth. I mean, it's, it's RF at the end of the day. And we're talking here about order of magnitude, two orders of magnitude, more devices. How, what's going to happen? I mean, how are they handling RF congestion? Well, I, well this, uh, BLE is broadcasting on three different channels. So it, it broadcasts on three different channels intentionally to avoid problems with other networks stepping on each other. Wi-Fi. Wi -Fi transmits on like 13. Well, <laughs> well another thing that, that, that Bluetooth does that Wi-Fi doesn't is, uh, you're right, I mean, <clears throat> there are more channels, by the way, but um, Bluetooth does channel hopping. So two devices, they kind of negotiate on a hopping scheme, and they continuously hop the frequencies uh, in order to get better coexistence. And Wi-Fi, once you're on a Wi-Fi hotspot, you stay on that same frequency. Um, so that's another thing. So there's like 30 channels, basically, that it hops between. Uh, 